Back in November, I played Deltarune Chapter 2 for the first time, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I wanted to play more of the game, but as of right now, only the first two chapters are out. So naturally, that left me pondering what these next chapters would be like. At the end of my Chapter 2 playthrough video I posted a couple of months ago, I showed my super brief theory on what might happen in the next chapters of Deltarune. In this video, I will greatly expand upon the theory I showed in that video and explain to you my theory concerning one of the Deltarune community's most burning questions. What's going to happen in the next chapters of Deltarune? Before I get started, I should mention that this video will contain spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale. So make sure you play through those games first before continuing with this video. These games are awesome! Anyway, without further ado, I am Red, and let's open the Fury Fountain. I'm going to be posing a lot of theories in this video. Some of them have a fairly solid foundation, and others, not so much. So I think it would be a good idea to address my methodology in creating my theories, so that you understand my thought process throughout this video. Perhaps it might also aid you in creating your own theories in the comments. I like to call this methodology the Tevax Method. Now I know that may sound like a funny name, but I think it's a great way to remember the steps involved, in which there are three of them. Step 1, represented by the T, you simply state your theory. Step 2, represented by the EV, you state the evidence that supports your theory. This evidence could be character dialogue, what happens in certain scenes from the game, or from other sources like the Deltarune website, as long as it's canon. Canon-ish, I guess. And finally, Step 3, represented by the X. You explain why the evidence supports your theory, and what it could mean to the story, plot, or characters. Let's explain this further using an example. A common theory that people tend to gravitate to when they first see Chapter 2's ending is that Chris is the knight. Let's break it down using the Tevex method. For the T part, you state the theory, which we did. So, one step done. For the Ev part, you state the evidence that supports your theory. Something like this. Simple enough. Finally, for the X part, you provide your explanation. It would probably go something like this. You can pause and read it if you want. And with that, we have made a fairly decent explanation of the theory with good evidence to support it. Now remember, since this is a theory, we are not 100% sure if this will be correct, but it's something nonetheless. This is what I'm going to use to explain most of my theories in this video. I won't go step by step like it did here, but I will be following the general Tevex formula throughout. Alright, let's proceed. My future chapter 3 will be split into two parts. The first part is going to be me explaining about some of the characters, what new information we might know about them, and how they might develop in the future chapters. The second part is going to be my theory on what might happen in each future chapter of Deltarune, starting from chapter 3 and going all the way to Chapter 7 and the ending. Let's start with Part 1 of my theory, the characters. There are four characters in this game that I know for sure will be strongly significant to the story, and that I know can be developed further in the future chapters. These four characters are as follows, Chris, Noel, Susie, and Rousey. For each of these characters, I will go through what they are like in the game, their backstory, and using that information, try to protect any character development that might happen in the future, and what information we might know about them. I will also look into some other characters from the game that could be of significance, but might not have as much of an impact as the main four that I have here. Let's start off with one of the more mysterious characters out of the four, Chris. Chris is the very character we control in game, and it is through them that we interact with the world of Deltarune. Most of what we know about Chris is within their backstory, so I'll explain that first. They're known to be quite mischievous, as seen from the various pranks they pulled on Noelle, in which they've done quite a few. Oh, and also this as well. Whoops. Chris also wasn't a very social person, something that is mentioned by Noelle at the gate in Chapter 1, and Rousey if you respond of nothing in the Acid River. 
Chris lives with the Dreamer family, although their family situation is not great. Toriel and Asgore are divorced, and Asriel, Chris's brother, has gone off to college, leaving just Chris and Toriel to live in the Dreamer house. Chris's family life is quite rough, and Chris isn't very enthusiastic about the situation, as mentioned by QC in the diner, and perhaps the receptionist from the hospital too, I guess. Probably the most fascinating part of Chris's backstory is their strong interest in the occult. This is also apparent from one of the links Chris clicks on when battling the pop-up. Interesting. For what they are like in the game, all I can say is that Chris is under our control, and whatever actions they do in the game are done by us, the player. As long as their soul is in their body, of course. However, we can kinda infer what they are like from one thing the other characters' reactions to what they say or their expressions. I should mention that yes, Chris does talk throughout the game, even if you don't prompt them through the dialogue boxes. It's just that we don't hear what they say. A good example is in the lines Noelle says after she joins your party. Assuming you go forward, she asks Chris where Susie is, then she suddenly questions why Chris is questioning her question. Say that five times fast. This implies that Chris does say something here, or at least shows a surprised expression to Noelle. No choice or dialogue here. There's many other examples of this, but I think this alone proves my point, and, as a bonus, it gives us another means to know what Chris is like. For one, they have quite the interest in Susie. This is apparent from their reaction to drinking the Susie tea, somewhat implied in Susie's reaction to Chris when we say you in this dialogue choice and heavily implied when they slash Toyo's car tires at the end of chapter 2. Chris also has a sort of love-hate relationship with us, the player. For one, Chris cannot function without the soul, or at least, not for very long, so they need to have it in them. For the hate part, Chris goes for some trauma after the Spamton Neo fight. Since Spamton is a puppet controlled by strings, a situation very reminiscent to Chris's, this makes sense. This is also quite apparent in her lack of enthusiasm in the weird route, and their expressions when we say stuff that they didn't want to. But there's also this one thing that Chris does where they, you know, rip your soul out of their body to do things outside our control. Yeah, I don't think Chris likes being controlled by us. So, given the information that we have about Chris's backstory, and what they are like in game, what can we infer about their character development in the future? What information are we still missing? I think the first thing that might be addressed is Chris's uneasy family situation. We don't know why Toriel and Asgore divorced, and importantly, why Asgore was fired from the police force. One thing's for sure, something bad would have needed to happen for Asgore to get removed from the police force. I feel that if Chris were to go for some character development, it would be regarding the relationship of us, the player. Considering Chris's love-hate relationship with the player, I feel that at some point, Chris is gonna address this relationship. Chris does not like being controlled by us, but at the same time, needs that soul in their body to function. I could possibly see a scene in the future chapter where they talk to us about their goals and desires, and us forming an agreement with Chris here. It would solve a lot of mysteries relating to Chris's character, but to me it seems kinda... Uh, unlikely. Also, it kinda breaks the fourth wall a little bit. The more likely option is that Chris will find a way to either manage this struggle throughout the whole game, or find a way to detach from us completely and freeing themselves from this control. In terms of if their interest with Susie will escalate further, I will have to say no to that, or at least if it does, it won't go too much further. There's already another candidate for that, you know the one. Either way, there's not a lot I can say about Chris. There are so many mysteries regarding their character that I can't really form a solid theory on it. Why did they open the fountain at the end of Chapter 2, even after the weird route? What are their goals? Are they the knight? Why did we gain control over them in the first place? Speaking of which, we don't really know why we gained control over Chris in the first place. Was this control given to us voluntarily by Chris, or was this control forced upon them? Considering that Chris has a history of the occult and an interest in demon summoning classes, it seems pretty likely that it's the former option. Either way, I feel that at some point, the game is gonna answer some, if not all of these questions. Just have to wait and see. With Chris out of the way, 
let's shift our attention to one of my favorite Deltarune characters, Noelle. Noelle is often viewed as being a sweet, nice, and soft reindeer girl who has a love for Christmas. She likes to go out of her way to make other people's days better, even if it means putting others first over herself. Something as simple as displaying a nice smile, giving someone else one of her candy cane pencils, sharing peppermint cookies, to helping others do their homework. I guess you could say that she's the definition of Christmas. I mean, her name literally IS the French word for Christmas. I'm not kidding, look it up. Noelle is also incredibly timid. Rudy, her dad, mentions that everything scares her, and when she gets scared, she freezes like a deer in headlights. There are a lot of examples in Chapter 2. She hesitates when signing the peon release form, she gets scared when hit by mice, until she isn't anymore. <laughs> she gets scared when entering battles, when crossing the road, when Queen is nearby, and freezes up when watching the fireworks in this scene. She even gets a little scared around Susie, and I guess people in general. You know what, same here. You know the weird part? She actually likes scary things. And that she tends to be drawn to things that scare her. Especially of Susie. Even though she's scared of Susie and sees the stuff Susie does to Chris, her obsession of Susie just draws her in anyway. After all, she describes Susie as being the good kind of scary. Wait, now that I think about it, Gosh dang it, Toby, how did he manage to capture the type of stuff Deer do in real life in a Noel's character? <laughs> did I say Noel had a crush on Susie? Oh yeah, perhaps she also has a knack for purple dragons too. I should also say that Noel acts really weird when Susie's on her mind. I guess her brain just shuts off when Susie's on her mind. Anyway, back on topic, she also has a hard time standing up for herself, and also doesn't really like engaging in arguments. Like I said, she wants to be nice and help others out, even if it's detrimental to her. Or even a little cruel. Noelle's redemption arc in Chapter 2 pretty much addresses exactly that. Addressing her helplessness in standing up to the Queen, and for herself in general. Hmm. Helplessness. 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 Learned helplessness. This is a concerning part of Noel's character. And it's what plays a part in her inability to stand up for herself. She doesn't feel like she has the ability to control or change the situations she gets herself into for the benefit of herself or others. Hmm, that sounds... oddly familiar. Here may not be a major theme of this game. Unfortunately, there's a lot of examples of this helplessness throughout chapters 1 and 2. In chapter 1, Noelle wants to partner up with Chris and make a group of three. But that plan fails when Susie enters the room and Alphys assigns Susie as Chris's partner. Later in the same scene, Noelle wants to go with Susie to get the chalk, but once again, Alphys tells Chris to go with her instead. At the start of Chapter 2, Noelle invites us to go study with her in the library. Susie ultimately turns her down and instead wants to hang out alone in the closet, or I guess, do crime. In the cyber world, she feels helpless in standing up to the Queen. So she takes the easy way out and signs the peon release form. She hides from the queen because she feels like she can't confront her at all. She feels that she can't say no to anyone but Chris and Dad. If you select Susie wouldn't hear, Noelle is put under the impression that Susie will just laugh at her and beat her up. And worst of all, when Queen enters her giga form, Noelle is quick in giving up and letting the queen take over. Thankfully, as Chapter 2 progresses, she slowly gets over her helplessness. She wants to form a truce with Chris, and we say yes, and she joins our party. She just changed the situation that she was in and got a rewarding outcome out of it. I think we all got a rewarding outcome out of that. <laughs> she finally starts to stand up for herself. If you say she is our enemy here, you force Noelle to stand up for herself. When she tells the team if she can tag along, Susie tells Noelle she can. Once again, she changes the situation she was in for a rewarding outcome. 
She even goes the extra mile in saying that she wants to be behind Susie here. And it works out. When on the team, Noelle starts participating in solving puzzles. And she does well. And Susie rewards her for it. Moving forward to this scene, Noelle fears that Susie doesn't care about her at all. But when Susie says, do you want to hang out some more, Noelle is absolutely ecstatic about that, and goes on a cute Ferris wheel ride of her. Maybe it turns out that Susie does care about her after all. Finally, at the very end of Chapter 2, when Queen threatens to crush Susie, something hits deep down in Noelle, and she snaps to the Queen, saying that she is not happy under her control. Queen rewards her with the ability to make the world that she wants. And afterward, Susie compliments her ability to stand up the Queen here. And that is Noelle's Chapter 2 Redemption Arc. She is finally starting to take control over the situations she gets herself into, and getting over her helplessness, at least a little bit. Oh, and to put one more cherry on top, it actually turns out that her inviting Susie over to study actually worked out after all. Aw, isn't that cute? And there you have it. That's what Noelle was like in the game. Now, what does she have in terms of her backstory? In this puzzle scene, Noelle explains how she used to explore the forest behind the graveyard of Chris. Azriel and her sister Des just want to see what is back there. Even though Noelle was really scared during these adventures, she didn't really mind being scared when the others were there to comfort her. Noelle, just like Chris, also has experience with the occult. Caddy taught her protection spells and showed her occult findings. These protection spells are probably her ice and healing spells in the Dark World. This is why she knows how to cast them, even in the first battle. The Spamton sweepstakes also introduced a lot of new lore to the story in the form of an ARG. Quite a bit of it is in the form of various blog posts belonging to Holiday Girl 1225 that are about the blogger's experience with creepy video game glitches and secrets in their childhood, along with some other stuff. It doesn't take a lot of thinking to realize that Noelle is the one who is writing these blog posts. So it turns out, she is a blogger who is interested in video games and glitches. Fascinating. There is a ton of interesting backstory about Noelle in these blog posts, which I will mention briefly. This first blog post is about one of Noelle's favorite games, Cat Petters 2. Cat Petters 2 is a simple pet raising game that has a really deep animation and breeding system. She explains how people have been able to hex edit the game data to create new pets. Chen explains that if two pets fall in love, an egg appears, and when hatched, a new pet appears which combines the animation and visual data of the two parents. However, if you try to breed two very different pets from different mods, you might get the message Incompatible Pet, which freezes the game in music. She was so scared seeing this message as a kid, she actually punished her pets so they never fall in love. In one of her longer play sessions of Cat Petters 2, where she was trying to get the ultimate cat, she got an egg labeled Special. However, the egg didn't hatch into anything, nor could she move it or throw it away. It even persisted after a reinstall of the game, which freaked her right out. She eventually opened the game again, and treated it like a normal pet. But the next day, that egg left home due to happiness, which was weird considering that normally, pets leave home due to sadness. She also mentions that the egg had a name, but she forgot what it was. Hmm. This last Cat Petters post mentions about Noelle's habit of reading her spam emails. One of these spam emails was from Spamton, which contained a mod for Cat Petters 2. Noelle installs it to her game, and when the game loaded, the pet in that mod was just one blue circle. Which is weird considering that normal pets have multiple circles, one for each body part. She explains that this circle was able to multiply, and when it does, a congregations message would pop up. Eventually, these circles would keep multiplying, until eventually, her game crashed. In this next post, she talks about her experience in the Ice Palace Maze in Dragon Blazers, an RPG game that she plays. She mentions going to this maze without a guide NPC, and getting stuck in there for hours trying to find an exit, not thinking it was a glitch. She then suddenly stumbles upon a door, which shocked her so much she unplugged the console. When she opened the game again, she was able to get right back to the door, but the door was locked, and she could never figure out how to open it. In subsequent playthroughs of the game, she was able to get right back to the door if she concentrated. In this last private post, Noelle mentions how close she used to be to Chris. 
she mentions that Chris would come to her house almost every day to play around. Eventually, Chris got very still, like they were remembering something. Then, they would go to the dining room to play the piano. When this happens, Noel would just sit in the living room listening to them play, thinking of it like a concert just for her. Considering that she and Chris both grew up together as neighbors, it makes sense. Also, there's, um, this in here too? And there you have it. That's all of Noelle's blog posts. Now for the sadder parts of Noelle's backstory. Noelle has issues with her family, the Holiday family. Her father Rudy is in the hospital for some illness that he has. Noelle is concerned about her dad's condition and feels helpless about helping him. The fear of her dad passing away really puts a toll on her mental condition, being heartbroken over the idea of it just being her and mom. I feel that this is one of the sources of her helplessness. Her mother, the town's mayor, is really tough on her, and is often distant. In Chapter 1, Noelle mentions that her mom doesn't like it when she bothers her while she's working, and rather than trying to stand up for her, she goes over to Caddy's instead for the night. In her Ice Palace blog post, she mentions having to hold her breath while crying to stop her mom from hearing her and unplugging the console. Not only from when she was crying, but even when she was excited when finding the door again. I guess this is her source of her timidness and why she's so scared of people, I guess. Lastly, I can't explain the sad part of Noelle's backstory without mentioning Des and her disappearance. From a few lines of dialogue in the game, especially this one, and the name December Holiday being commonly present in Noelle's search history, it is heavily implied that Des is no longer with Noelle. As confirmed by the Spamton sweepstakes, Des has gone missing, and we need to find her. Des was a comforting memory in Noelle's childhood. They watched horror movies together, passed her bedtimes, and made an angel tall together. Des was a role model in Noelle's life, but one day, she disappeared, which put a toll on Noelle's mental health. Combined with her father being in the hospital and her mom being hard on her, she's got a rough. She might be sweet, soft, and nice on the outside, but in her deeper nuances, there's a lot of things that are very uneasy for her concerning her helplessness and the ongoing anxiety over the condition of her family. It really hits home Noelle's views of the Dark World, where she sees them as an escape from her rough life, where she can make friends, use magic, and go on interesting adventures. Even though she thinks it's all a dream, she wishes she can have more of them so she can escape from her troubles in the Light World. This is a certain theme I will consider in the later part of the video. So, with all of this information that we have, what can we infer about what happens to her in the future? I can definitely see where Toby wants to take her character in the future chapters. I can see Noelle as a wholesome yet hit you hard in the feels kind of character. The game already does hit you hard in the feels with her when you go through chapter 2's weird route, so I can definitely see Toby going down this path. Considering what she says in this scene, I know that Noelle wants to explore more of these dark worlds, quote unquote have more dreams like this. So it is almost certain that we will see her take part in some of the Dark Worlds in future chapters and tanking along with the main party. For these future adventures, I could see her making some more friends along the way, becoming more comfortable around others, overcoming a lot of her fears, and overall, becoming a better character and proving what she is capable of now that she has some agency. In terms of character development, we've already seen her go through one of her redemption arcs in Chapter 2 but she stood up to the Queen and overcame some of her helplessness. But I feel that this redemption arc is only really a starting point for a whole bunch of additional character development to happen. Here's my theory. I think that Noelle will go for at least two more redemption arcs in the future chapters. Maybe three if I want to push things a little bit. One of her next redemption arcs is probably going to involve her standing up to her mother in order to find peace in this relationship. As mentioned before, Noelle is afraid of bothering her mom for the key while she is working, and she feels heartbroken over the idea of it just being her and mom. I believe that the entirety of Noelle's first redemption arc is just a setup for a further confrontation with her mother in the future chapter, sort of a practice run if you will. The way that Noelle was treated by Queen in Chapter 2 is fairly reminiscent to how she was treated by her mother in the Light World, being hard on her and perhaps a little controlling. So I feel at some point, just like she did to Queen in her first redemption arc, I believe she will do the same for her mother in a mission to find peace in their relationship. 
This redemption arc would go one step further in developing Noelle's ability to stand up for herself and take control of her life, perhaps even let go of some of her fears while she is at it. For the other redemption arc, I actually have a pretty interesting idea of when this redemption arc could take place, and it's something I'm going to come back to later. There are also some mysteries about Noelle's character in the Holiday family that also might be addressed in future chapters. For one, we don't know what caused Des to go missing, or where she could be. We are also unsure about what's going to happen to Rudy. Rudy himself thinks that he will be okay, whereas helpless Noelle is afraid of the worst. Lastly, we don't know too much about Noelle's mom. We don't even know what her name is, only what it starts with. We know that she is the mayor of hometown and is often very busy. She is mentioned as having no charisma, being cold, and also being really intimidating considering these dogs' reactions to her mercilessly coming after them when they try to sneak into her house over the holidays. This could also be why she ran unopposed for the longest time. My guess is that we're gonna know more about her when we have to cause a terrible crisis. I am definitely gonna address this line in a later part of the video. Oh, and for the shippers out there, how about her crush of Susie? How's that gonna go? Considering how strongly this is pushed within the game, and considering one of the things addressed in Noelle's character development relating to taking actions and getting rewarded for them, I could definitely see this relationship working out. Susie does have some feelings for her after the first we'll see when she says, maybe someday we could, dot dot dot. Maybe at the end of the game, Noelle could finally confess her love of Susie, and Susie saying yes to that, that being the final reward for Noelle's treacherous journey. It just works perfectly in the context of Noelle's character development, and if it happens, I could see this being the final redemption arc for Noelle. After all, in Undertale, Alphys and Undyne had a crush on each other, and that ended up working out if you complete the pacifist route. Maybe the same might happen to Noelle and Susie in Deltarune if you complete the main route. Phew, that was a lot of information I needed to explain there. Now that Noelle is out of the way, at least for now, what about Susie? All of the students in the classroom except for Noelle describe Susie as being a very mean student who bullies people. This is very apparent when we exit the classroom where she acts mean, menacingly, and scary to Chris. She pushes us to the locker and tells them their choices don't matter, and enforces that idea throughout the game, even in a chapter 2. She calls herself for walking too slow, she pushes us to go into the dark closet, she acts menacingly to Lancer for not being scary enough, she does a lot of name calling like calling other people freaks, chumps, etc. So yeah, she just does the things bullies do. Susie is also very selfish and self-centered. She doesn't have a care in the world and what others think. She doesn't care if the world gets destroyed because she doesn't think that's her problem. She refuses to adhere to the legend and instead, she wants to abide by her own rules and go off on her own. She fights everything that gets her in the way and also annihilates Top Chef's cake while she's at it. We have to warn enemies of our attacks if we want to spare them. Heck, even at one point, she even leaves her party to join up with Lancer to be a part of the bad guys in one of the funniest plot twists in this game so far. Again, she likes to make her own rules and ensure that our choices don't matter. She's also quite eager to do the things she wants to do, and doesn't hesitate to bring Chris along for the ride, which is especially the case when entering the Dark Worlds in both chapters. At the beginning of Chapter 1's Dark World, she doesn't wait for Chris at all and just wants to keep moving on her own. She's too impatient to stick to the legend, and just leaves so she can go straight home. I think a good way to put Susie's character is that she is basically the polar opposite of Noelle. Instead of being nice, kind, and timid, she is mean, selfish, and brave. Perhaps sarcasm plays a role in Susie's character, too. Rousey mentions her as being sarcastic in the Acid River. There are some examples of this. She jokes about impaling herself both in the block puzzle scene from Chapter 1 and in her Dark World room in Chapter 2. And hey, she is ultimately the one to teach Rousey how to be sarcastic in Chapter 2. So well, there you go. For now, Chapter 1, we start getting a taste of Susie's deeper nuances. In this scene where we choose the name of our party, Susie mentions that Lancer being like her is stupid. This opens up a thing in Susie where she doesn't really like herself. She isn't comfortable about her appearance and likes to hide parts of her. In Chapter 1, she covers her eyes with her hair. 
She covers her tail with her jacket. And yes, Susie does have a tail. When Noelle mentions about Susie's tail in Chapter 2, Susie gets very uncomfortable and tries to pass it off as being part of Noelle's dream. When Noelle looks for her tail again in the computer lab, yeah, she's really weird. Susie once again gets uncomfortable and scares her off in one of the funniest expressions in this game. At least that time it was warranted. Come on, Noelle. Okay, one more thing. Susie's also got this impression that nobody wants to be her friend. There isn't too much evidence of this, but considering all the bullying she does to Chris, how self-centered she is, and how uncomfortable she gets when Latris says that she's a good friend in this scene, it's there. Okay, so what about character development? Susie does go for her own redemption arc in Chapter 1, which mainly addresses her rudeness and selfish nature, but also gets a bit more comfortable around other people and herself. Throughout the forest area, she starts to form a bond with Lancer, and it continues when going for this long walkway. Although in the prison she is initially mad at Lancer for betraying her, and she nearly takes him down, she spares him in the end. Susie makes a breakthrough in the prison area where she wants to talk it out with the King Peaceful style, and makes an agreement with Lancer to help accomplish her plan. In the elevator scene, she wants to try acting with Chris and Rousey, and that's what she tries doing throughout the card castle. This is a huge change in Susie, but she goes from impulsively attacking everything in her path to finally realizing the point in acting and showing mercy to others. She finally starts to listen to Chris and Rousey because she feels it's the only way she can go home. She overcomes quite a lot of her selfish nature and some of her rudeness. That's already a lot of change with her, but wait, there's more. She really grasps friendship when we get to the King fight. Susie gets concerned when the King picks up Lancer, and even mentions Lancer as her friend in her talk with the King. After the battle, Susie tells King to get away from her friend, Chris. Her seeing Chris as a friend here is a complete 180, especially compared to how she was treating them before. And to end off her redemption arc, Susie really solidifies her new mindset of acting, and actually having care for others. And hey, as a bonus, she starts getting a little more comfortable about herself, and starts showing her eyes at the end of Chapter 1. Boom. And that is her Chapter 1 redemption arc, and boy did it change a lot in Susie. In terms of character development in Chapter 2, there isn't as much as Chapter 1, but there is a little bit. We see Susie really solidifying her friendship with Lancer and Rousey throughout the chapter, both when she meets them again in the castle town and throughout the cyber world. In the sweet Captain Cake's fight, she's the one who takes acting to the next level by giving us the action commands. She starts acting a lot nicer in this as well. Although she still acts mean towards Burgley in this puzzle scene, She's the one who compliments Noelle on the various actions she does, and is the one who helps her go for her character development, which I explained before. And again, there's that small part of Susie that is catching up onto a potential relationship with Noelle. When we leave the Dark World, Susie further solidifies her friendship with Chris, where she follows us around in the hometown, and we even take her home to sleep for the night, even though she is a bit uncomfortable about that last part. So there you have it. That was what Susie was like in the game. Now, what about her backstory? The first part of her backstory is actually in Noelle's blog, so let's go back to that. There is a post explaining an affair that Chris and Susie had in the classroom, and how much Susie hates Chris. Chris was sleeping in class, and Susie wanted to wake them up. She was quite jealous that Chris's hair smelled like apples, which is something she complains about in the game, too. Because of this jealousy, she wanted to show Chris what would happen if their hair kept smelling like apples, but just to bite through an apple and tell Chris that's what their head would look like. Susie kept trying to bully Chris in various ways, like throwing the apple at Chris, but due to Chris's gamer reaction speed, that apple was stopped by them. Susie then proceeds to grab Chris by the hair, and telling them that their family doesn't care about them. Chris says something to Susie here, but whatever it was, Susie gets really mad and immediately leaves the classroom, which scared Noelle, who was watching the whole thing outside, right into her locker. Susie also has a little bit of backstory about her interactions with Noelle in the past. She recalls Noelle giving her a candy cane pencil, and the little smile she gave afterward. In response, Susie spared her. 
This is probably the reason why Noelle doesn't see her as being as bad as compared to the other students in the classroom. Also, Susie ate the pencil right after. <laughs> I guess she was a little hungry. Apart from that, in a small part of Susie's backstory where she accidentally kicks a ball into Undyne's car, that's about it. At least the parts of it that are concrete. Actually, quite a lot of Susie's backstory is implied in some of her actions within the game, which I will get to now. Susie complains about being hungry in many parts of the game, implying that she wasn't very well fed. This is probably why she eats strange things like the chalk, the pencils Noelle gives her, and always gets jealous when sniffing Chris's apple-scented hair. She does get upset when Chris sees her eat the chalk. As mentioned before, Susie is not happy about herself, and is not happy about others knowing about these things, which is why she gets upset at Chris here. When Rousey shows Susie her own room in the castle town, there's some implications in Susie's dialogue here that hints her potentially not having her own room in her home life. There are parts of Chapter 2 that show Susie's liking for boxes. If you interact with the stall that Noelle was in in this scene, Susie tells her where she put that box she was wearing on her head. Susie also gets excited when she sees the boxes in the Cyber City. Perhaps this could imply that boxes were an important part of Susie's life, where she either played with them, used them as a shelter, or to even hide. Lastly, at the end of Chapter 2, when we bring Susie home, she is initially afraid of going into the house, until Toria tells her she's breaking up high. When she goes into the house, she gets really nervous around Toria, where she looks up and calls her by her formal name. She's also afraid to use slightly mild language around Toriel. When Toriel tells Susie to call her parents, she refuses to do so. This could potentially imply that Susie's home life was not great, and that her parents were really hard on her. This would explain pretty much everything about Susie's character, why she was a bully, and perhaps why she was so hungry all the time, and of course, why she acted so nervously in the Dreamer house. And there you have it. That was what Susie's backstory was like. Now, using this information that we have about Susie, what can we infer about her in the future? I know that Susie will slowly get more comfortable with herself and around others throughout the whole game, and make some more friends along the way. Susie did get a lot more comfortable around Toriel in the Dreamer House, so I could see this continuing further. Perhaps maybe at some point in her development, she might get comfortable enough to start showing her tail, wink wink. Considering that Noelle and Azrael both have a knack for the How to Draw Dragons book, which contains a purple dragon on the cover dressed immodestly, just like what Susie is, I can kind of see where this is going. We've seen Susie go through one of her redemption arcs in Chapter 1, where she overcomes a lot of her rudeness, selfishness, and becomes more comfortable about herself and around others. So what future redemption arcs do I see Susie going through? Here's what I think. I think Susie is in a fairly good state right now, at least on the outside, but in her more nuanced parts of her character, there's still quite a lot that's bothering her. I can see Susie going for at least one more redemption arc in the future chapters, and it's going to address a lot of the things that are bothering her deep down. As mentioned before, there are many implications made in the game that suggest that Susie had a rough life before she came to hometown, concerning her home life and how her parents treated her which is why she is the way she is in game. So I feel that Susie's next redemption arc is going to be her coming clean about her backstory, similar to how Birdley comes clean about his backstory in his monologue here. Obviously this would reveal a lot about Susie's backstory, and would go one step further in improving Susie's character, and making her more comfortable around herself and others. With Susie out of the way, now we can look at the last character out of the four, Rousey. In terms of backstory, um, there's basically nothing. <laughs> Rousey mentions that he was waiting alone at the castle town his whole life for Chris and Susie to arrive. And well, that's it. <laughs> for what Rousey is like in the game, he is a kind and soft prince who possesses a lot of knowledge about the dark worlds, and of the light world too. He likes to act softly to everyone, and wishes that we can act softly to everyone throughout the adventure. Rousey mostly sticks to his wisdom and keeps Chris and Susie in check, both with his morals and with the main legend where we need to seal the fountains and banish the angels' heaven, along with what things to avoid to prevent the world from ending. 
In terms of character development, there isn't really too much that goes on with Rousey, but there is some. One example is where he changes from thinking we can act softly to everyone, to saying that will not work on everyone. At first, Rousey figured that to be friends of someone, all he has to do is be nice to them. In the Acid River scene in Chapter 2, Rousey realizes that friendship is a lot more nuanced than that, and that it's more about knowing what someone else is like and appreciating them for what they are. It's a pretty interesting and philosophical thought if you think about it. Initially, he is uncomfortable about his self-appearance, but this is remedied throughout Chapter 1. Initially, he hides his appearance with his hood, then he removes that after the first battle with Lancer, and at the end of Chapter 1, he removes his hat, showing his face. When this happens, we realize how strongly Rousey resembles Azrael, considering his appearance and the fact that his name is an anagram of Azrael. Noel even makes a comment on how he looks like Azrael in Chapter 2. Now, when we get to Chapter 2, there are a few things introduced about Rousey that start to get, you know, a little suspicious. Rousey knows a shocking amount of information about the light world that Chris and Susie come from, considering his description of the school and Chris's room. A little later on, Rousey walks into the cyber world out of nowhere because he felt a dark presence. Okay. Fast forward to the mansion, Rousey mentions this one plot point where any darkeners that go to a world different from their own turn to stone. Yet Rousey, who is a darkener, doesn't turn to stone in the cyber world. He does mention that his world is made from pure darkness, which could explain it, but I'm not sure. There are also these conversations that Rousey has with Chris when we are not looking. In both chapters 1 and 2, he tells us if we are wondering what Susie is doing. If we say yes, those scenes play out, but when we come back, we see the tail end of a conversation that Rousey has with Chris. And finally, near the end of Chapter 2, Rousey does not mention about the Roaring until he absolutely needs to, which was when Birdly was going to make a fountain in the cyber world. So yeah, Rousey is very suspicious. And well, that's all the information we have about him. So using this information, what can I deduce about Rousey in the future? First of all, we know nothing about Rousey's backstory. How did he attain all the knowledge that he has? What light world object is he made from? I could guess Chris's red horns, but there's no evidence on that. Why does he look so similar to Azrael? All of this, we currently don't know. What definitely needs to be addressed is the suspicious things that Rousey does in Chapter 2. There's still a lot of mysteries about the Dark Worlds that we still don't know about, and that Rousey is potentially hiding from us. How can he travel from Dark World to Dark World, even when they are quite distant, how does he know about the settings and features of the Light World? What is the topic of those conversations that he has with Chris? What else is Robsy hiding from us? Well, unfortunately, I don't really have any solid conclusions on Rousey. Only questions. There are just so many mysteries about his character that I can't form a solid theory on it. The best I can say is that a lot of these mysteries will get addressed in future chapters. Rousey has information that is significant to the story, hence the reason why I put him into the main four. And I think that throughout these chapters, he's slowly going to give us more of his information about the Dark Worlds, and what we need to watch out for him when exploring and creating them. And you're probably asking, do I think that Rousey will turn evil? Probably not. And well, that's about it for the main four characters that I've listed here. Now before I get to my chapter by chapter fury, I want to address a few more characters that could be of significance, but might not have as much of an impact as the main four. Let's start off with Birdly. Birdly, as we all know, is this egotistical gamer who always mentions about how smart he is and how much of a gamer he is. Oh yeah, gaming. <laughs> when we first meet him in the class, he refuses to group up with us because he's already grouped up with the second smartest student and he wants to get an A. He also rejects Noelle's idea of making a group of three. Fast forward to the coaster scene in Chapter 2. He mentions about wanting to build a smartopia where all the smart people can thrive and live in bliss. He goes to the Queen's side and hopes that her plan will help him do just that. He keeps his mindset of being the smart egotistical individual, constantly referencing how smart he is and how much of a gamer he is throughout most of Chapter 2. 
Birdly does go through character development of his own in the cyber world. After the third light puzzle in the Queen's Mansion, where he gets absolutely roasted by Susie for not being able to do the puzzle, Birdly goes through his monologue where he admits that he isn't as smart as he turns out to be. He mentions that he only adopted this smart mindset from a spelling bee daddy one, that he is the smartest student in class because Noel helps him study, and that she is the real smart kid. Birdly goes from being egotistical and always talking about how smart he is, to embracing ignorance. Even mentioning that he's stupid right in Noel's face. I don't know why I found that funny. With this new mindset in place, he stops looking up to Noel for her smarts, and instead, switches his interest towards Susie instead. Obviously, Noelle is not happy about that and, um, does this. She's really putting that character development to good use, huh? To finish off Burley's redemption arc, when Queen enters her Giga form, he responds by recruiting everyone to help build the ultimate group project. A Frash machine made using the friends we made along the way. <laughs> we use this machine in the Giga Queen fight to ultimately defeat her and save the day. And well, that's it for Birdly. Apart from some childish stuff he does at the end here. Ah, <laughs> oh, Birdly. Now one of the reasons I didn't include Birdly in the main list of characters is that his redemption arc did feel quite complete for his character. He just admits to being not as smart and accepting that. Birdly solved. The even bigger reason is from what happens to him in the weird route. We all know that in the weird route, we manipulate Noelle into using her Snowgrave spell on Birdly which freezes him. When we return to the light world, Birdly does not wake up. Based on this bee toy in the hospital, it is quite likely that he will not wake up. Normally, the beads on this toy are going on their set path, but in the weird route, one of the blue beads is broken and torn off. No one else is blue? Yeah. In the main route, even though Birdly's character development is fairly complete, it doesn't mean he can't continue being a part of the story, of course. I could see him taking part in some important light world scenes in the future. Perhaps he might even tag along with the main party in some chapter. Although that is speculation, of course, and I don't have any evidence to support that. Overall, I don't have too much to say about Birdly. Now for another character that is definitely more significant to the story, Des. Des is definitely an important character considering how much her disappearance affects Noelle, and also how important Des was to her life. We know that Des was a role model in Noelle's life. She watched horror movies with Noelle, went on adventures with her, Chris and Azriel, and kept Noelle out of trouble from Chris's various pranks using her wiffle bat. Perhaps she's a little barbaric, considering that. <laughs> Other than that, we don't know too much about Des. Obviously, the main thing with her is that she went missing at some point. Then we need to figure out what happened to her. Then we need to find her, at least according to the sweepstakes. Considering her importance, I feel there is most likely going to be some part of a future chapter that will involve Des in some way. This is something I will come back to in my chapter by chapter theory. Another potential character that I think could become relevant is Caddy. Caddy works at the diner, of course, and is also a student in the class. Caddy is the one I explained before that introduced Chris and Noelle into the occult. There's actually a surprising amount of stuff that Caddy knows about. She mentions that Noelle and Chris walk among the dark, making me believe that she knows about the dark worlds. There's also a room in the Queen's Mansion dedicated to her, at least assuming it's spelled wrong and it's not referring to this caddy. Huh. This is telling me that she could be a candidate for being part of the dark world at some point, and could be of some importance. But again, what do you think? What about Jockington? Jockington is described as being a curious and precious snake who likes sports. I included him because he does have a room of his own in the Queen's Mansion. Considering his high curiosity, I could definitely see Jockington liking the Dark Worlds if he does get involved in one in a future chapter. In terms of if he will be a part of the Dark World at some point, I don't know. What about Azrael? Azrael was an important character in Chris's life. There is some backstory relating to Azrael where he took Chris to the diner every Sunday, even after their parents divorced. He also played video games with Chris, and was part of those adventures that Noelle was talking about in Chapter 2. As we already know, Azriel is currently in college and plans to return next week. In terms of if he will be an important character or not, I am not sure. 
I thought I'd include him because of how strongly Rousey, an important character, resembles him, and how important he was to Chris's life. Other than that, I don't really have a lot to say about Asriel. Lastly, what about some other characters? How about some other darkners like Lancer, the King, the Queen, Rules Card, etc.? Well, for all of them, I don't really see them playing too big of a role in any of the future chapters, at least outside of the castle town. Remember the plot mechanic mentioning that darkners that go to a dark world area than their own or the castle town turn to stone? That's why. Alright, and that's everything I wanted to cover for all of the characters in the game. Now it's time for the second and most interesting part of this video, my chapter by chapter theory. For each chapter, I will mainly be concerned about some of the major elements, and perhaps going into some details whenever I can. I will mainly consider three categories for each chapter, the potential settings, the potential characters, and any major scenes or events that might happen. For the settings, I might include the following, what the theme of the Dark World could be, the major areas of that Dark World, and the setting of the Light World. For the characters, I might include the following, any new characters that might be introduced, any existing characters that might be involved, and any potential bosses we could come across, and maybe some game mechanics while we're at it, too. <laughs> For any major scenes or events, I'll explain what might happen in them, and how it could develop or change the story's plot, and any character development that might occur in that major scene or event. This is how I'm going to structure each chapter in my chapter by chapter theory. I might not include all of these points for each chapter, especially the later ones where we have very little information about them, but other than that, that's what I'm considering. Now before I start, I should also note that my theories will mainly focus on the main route of the game, and not the weird route. I might briefly explain some elements the weird route could have, but again, I will mostly be concerning the main route for this video. Alright, I think you know the drill. It's time to dive in. With Chapter 3 being the earliest unreleased chapter of Deltarune, it isn't surprising that this is the chapter that we have the most information about. Not only from the game itself, but also from the many teasers included in both the Spamton sweepstakes and the 2022 status update. So, using all of this information that we have, what can I deduce about Chapter 3? In terms of setting, it seems pretty clear at this point that Chapter 3's Dark World is going to take place in a TV slash entertainment world. There is a staggering amount of evidence that supports this. In Chapter 2's ending after Chris creates the fountain, a TV can be seen with a smile on it in the darkness. Many of Spampton's lines also make reference to CRTs. In the 2022 status update, one of the images shown under the line, Relax and enjoy a world of cutting-edge entertainment, shows a room that could be part of a movie studio. I think at this point, the evidence speaks for itself. I don't need the X and Tevex to explain this very. Okay, so we know what the main theme of Chapter 3's Dark World is going to be. What about some of the major sub-areas of that Dark World? Chapter 1's Dark World had the Field of Hopes and Dreams, the Checkerboard, the Scarlet Forest, and the Card Castle. Chapter 2's Dark World had the Cyber Field, Cyber City, and the Queen's Mansion. So, for Chapter 3, what are its areas going to be themed around? One of these major areas of Chapter 3's Dark World is definitely going to be a movie studio of some kind. From the picture I just showed, it definitely resembles a room that could be a part of a movie studio, considering the star door, this little shop at the top here, the CRTs at the bottom, and even this little detail with the wires hanging from the top. Once again, very solid evidence supporting this. I don't need to explain it. There's even some information on what this studio could contain. If you navigate to this room in the Spampton sweepstakes, this star door leads to a changing room with a shadow figure behind the curtain. Clicking on this left door leads to these two weathermen. Based on this, I can definitely see the studio containing a set for a weather report. At the end of Chapter 2, one of the channels that Susie scrolls through is a weather channel. Oh yeah, we're almost certainly getting a weather report segment within the studio. If these channels that Susie scrolls through in this scene are of any consideration, we might also get a cooking show segment, and even a giant monster movie special. There isn't any other evidence that supports these two segments being in Chapter 3. So I'm a little skeptical on these. So we know of almost certainty that a studio will be one of the sub-areas of Chapter 3. What are the other sub-areas of Chapter 3 going to be? Once again, the Spampton Sweepstakes has information on it that may suggest certain themes that could make an appearance in this chapter. A possibility for one of these sub-areas 
is that one of them can have a Wild West kind of theme. There is this one page where Chris and Susie are dressed in Western attire. This could suggest that one of the sub areas of Chapter 3 is going to have a Wild West theme. Neat. At least that's what I thought at first. Unfortunately, in the spring newsletter that came out in the process of making this video, it looks like this section of the game is likely getting cancelled, so I wouldn't bail on this being a sub of Chapter 3's Dark World. Unless... No, I'm just kidding. Another possibility for a sub area could have a detective slash crime investigation theme associated with it. There is this page where the party members dress up as detectives and shoot bullets at these shadow figures to race their mercy bar, which certainly shows one of the enemies are going to battle and recruit in Chapter 3. Now, my skeptical side sees this as just a fun little interaction, just like the nurse outfits that our party wears when taking care of the Vera Virokins in Chapter 2, and not a hint of a certain area existing within the world. But if this is the case, it would be quite cool, and it would fit with the theme of mystery that Deltarune has, which is apparent with the mysteries regarding Chris, Rousey, Des, the man behind this tree, and whoever is responsible for driving Jevelyn's Pampton mad. Other than that, that's all of the evidence that point to certain settings existing in Chapter 3's Dark World. So now, what about the Light World? What we do know is that there is going to be a festival that will be set up in this chapter. In Chapter 2, the receptionist at the town hall mentions that the mayor is busy preparing for the festival tomorrow. Susie also talks about the festival in this final scene here. Now what are we going to see at this festival? What we do know is that there might be a ferris wheel at the festival. Noelle mentions about the time she rode the ferris wheel with Chris in some parts of Chapter 2. Both of you say, I will ride with you here, and in the ferris wheel scene with Susie. So it seems quite likely that we will see a ferris wheel as part of the festival. Perhaps we could ride that ferris wheel with someone like Toriel, Susie, Noelle, maybe someone else. Although that riding part is speculation. That would actually be pretty cool and make the light world section of this chapter quite interesting, compared to how it was in the last two chapters. Apart from that, that's all I know regarding the festival. Now, there is one more thing that I know we can do in the Light World in Chapter 3, and it involves a small little side quest. In Chapter 2, if you talk to someone else in Naps to Blue's house, that person asks you to bring something entertaining and have it there by tomorrow, and this person wants it because the internet is down, which is a minor plot point in Chapter 2. So hey, there's something else we can do. Other than that, there isn't really too much more I can say about the light world, and of setting in general. Now, what about some new characters that we could see in Chapter 3? For the main antagonist of Chapter 3's Dark World, it seems quite likely that it's going to be Mike. In Chapter 1, Jabal mentions about the Knight's Hand drifting forward, bringing the Queen's return. The main antagonist of Chapter 2 did end up being the Queen, meaning that Jevil foreshadowed the main antagonist in Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, Spamton mentions about the character Mike, and mentions not to believe anything you see on TV because that man's a criminal. That seems like a pattern to me, for the secret boss of one chapter foreshadows the main antagonist of the following chapter. Assuming that this pattern continues, it seems pretty likely that Mike is going to be the main antagonist of Chapter 3's Dark World. For what Mike could be like, there isn't really any other evidence apart from the name, that he's a criminal, and in the context of Spampton's line here implying his existence on TV. You know what? I think it's speculation time. I could see Mike acting in the same manner as Metaton from Undertale, where he would host various shows that viewers could tune in and watch, and we would need to play a part in with high stakes. I could see this being super interesting, especially with Susie and Rousey thrown into the mix, compared to Undertale where it was just fresk. Alright, speculation over. So apart from Mike, what about some other characters? In the Spamton sweepstakes, there is a mention of another character, Tenna. Since Tenna could be short for Antenna, an apparatus commonly present on CRT televisions, it seems likely that Tenna will be another character in Chapter 3. I don't know what their role could be though, whether they could be the secret boss, or just some side character similar to Rules Card. I know I'm saying this a lot, but what do you think? What about these two weathermen I showed before? There might be additional characters that could be present in Chapter 3 that could be part of a weather report section of that chapter that I explained before. If you do click on them, you get the phrase, the weather always sticks together. I could see them playing a similar role to the sweet Captain Cakes in Chapter 2, where they have a unique boss fight associated with them and their own role within the story. Now that we know all the new characters that we could see, 
what existing characters are going to be involved in Chapter 3's Dark World. Now before I get to that, I want to explain a certain pattern that I've seen in this game so far. What I've noticed is that each Dark World majorly evolved around one character, and somewhat revolved around another side character. The main character that the world revolves around is what gets the most attention in that chapter in terms of character development, and this is the one that plays a major role in that chapter, like joining the party for example. The other side character would still go for their own character development, and would be involved in parts of the chapter like being a part of a battle, but won't be as central as the main character. Let's start from the beginning. Chapter 1's Dark World revolved around Susie, as she was the main focus of Chapter 1. She went for the most character development in that chapter, going from being really self-centered and mean, to seeing a point in acting and caring for others. She played a major role in that chapter, which was mainly being a part of the party and preventing the king from hurting Chris at the end here. The side character of Chapter 1's Dark World is Lancer. He goes for character development of his own and played his own smaller role, which was to make an agreement of Susie and talk to the king. Chapter 2's Dark World revolved around Noelle, and she was the main focus of Chapter 2. She is the one chosen by the Queen to make into her peon. She joins her party in the Cyber City, and is the one that goes for the most character development, going from being helpless against the Queen, to being the one that stands up to her in saving the day. I also can't forget about her major role in the Weird Route, too. The side character of Chapter 2 is obviously Birdly. He goes through character development of his own in this chapter, which I explained before. He doesn't play as big of a role as Noel, but is still involved in many parts of the chapter, where he was a part of some boss fights, and is also the one that helped us recruit everyone and build the Frash Machine to defeat Giga Queen, to also save the day. Now that I've established this pattern, what about Chapter 3? What will Chapter 3's Dark World evolve around, and what will the side character be? It seems pretty likely that the main character that Chapter 3 will evolve around is Toriel, and the side character will be Undyne. In Chapter 2's ending, Toriel is in the same room that the Fountain is created, so it seems likely that she will be a part of Chapter 3's Dark World. For Undyne, just before the ending, Toriel calls her over to investigate her car slash tires. Since Chris opens the door here before making the Fountain, it seems quite likely that Undyne might walk into the house and stumble her way into the Dark World, similar to how Chris and Susie did in Chapter 1, and perhaps Noelle and Birdly in Chapter 2. As an added bonus, in both Chapters 1 and 2, you can tell Undyne about the Dark Worlds, and she shrugs it off like it's no big deal. This just adds more fuel to the fire for Undyne being a part of this Dark World. Now, what does this mean for Toriel and Undyne's character? Since Toriel is likely going to be the main character of this chapter, she's going to play a major role, and will be the one to go for the most character development. She could join our party, and could even be the character we need to manipulate to make the choices for us in the Weird Route, similar to what we did with Noelle back in Chapter 2. That's assuming that the Weird Route will continue into the later chapters, which it probably will, and that it will involve more than just manipulating Noelle, which I hope is the case. So, what about Undyne? Just like Lancer and Birdly in their respective chapters, she would still go for her own character development, and would be involved in parts of the chapter, but won't be as central as Toriel. In summary, Toriel and Undyne are likely going to be the main characters of Chapter 3. So, what about bosses? If we know the pattern that we've seen from the last two chapters, we might be having a battle with the main antagonist near the end of the Dark World, and that will be the main barrier between us and sealing the Dark Fountain. Since I've deduced that Mike is probably going to be the main antagonist, that's what we will be battling against. I could speculate this boss fight being the real finale of Mike's whole show, similar to the Metaton X fight from Undertale. That'd be kinda neat. What about the secret boss? Well, unfortunately, I don't really have an answer on that. What we do know is that the previous two secret bosses mainly concerned Deltarune's theme of freedom. Shovel thought of himself as the free one in the game. Spamton is a puppet controlled by strings who wants to free himself and go to the light world, or heaven in his own words, and become a big shot. So my guess is that Chapter 3's secret boss will stick to the freedom theme as well. Another thing that we do know is that in order to defeat Chapter 3's secret boss, we would need to use the power of the Shadow Mantle. A mantle is a sleeveless garment, typically worn over clothing. In the context of an RPG, a mantle could be used as protection against certain attacks. 
This leads me pretty well into a new game mechanic that is currently in the game, but will become much more apparent in Chapter 3 and beyond. The Element System. If you don't already know, each enemy and character in Deltarune can have one or more elements associated with them. This element is what makes up their magic attacks. For example, Susie has the Rude element, and is the element of her Rude Buster attack. Noelle has the Ice element, and is the element of her Ice attacks. Werewires and Werewires have the Electric element, and is what makes up their attacks, and so on. There is an item in Chapter 2 that reduces the damage taken from attacks made of certain elements, the Mannequin. It reduces damage from attacks made of the puppet slash cat elements by 35%, notably attached from spam to Neo, Tasks, and Task Manager. The Frey Bowtie and the Dealmaker also reduce damage taken from puppet slash cat attacks by 15% and 40% respectively. So how does this relate to the Shadow Mantle? I can see the Shadow Mantle being an armor item that reduces the damage from attacks of certain elements, and that these elements that it defends from might make up the attacks from Chapter 3's secret boss. It makes it pretty easy to see how it would be nearly impossible to win against this boss without the Shadow Mantle, as their attacks would deal a lot of damage without it. And that's all I have for the characters for Chapter 3. Now, what major scenes or events could happen in Chapter 3? I don't really have too many ideas, so I will mainly look at some potential scenes that could develop both Toriel and Undyne's character. There are probably going to be scenes in Chapter 3 that will serve the purpose of developing Toriel's character. There are quite a lot of issues and conflicts relating to Toriel's character that I could see being developed in this chapter. For one, Toriel knows something is up with Chris, but it's not putting enough attention to it. I guess in this chapter, she could get a taste of what's going on with Chris, and her character development might involve her realizing this fact and finally starting to do something about it. I could even see this being brought one step further in the weird route. Toriel also feels a little heartbroken and lonely from her divorce with Asgor, and Azrael being off to college. Maybe in one of these scenes in Chapter 3, she could open up on some of her backstory, like why she divorced with Asgor, and could even give us an insight on Chris's character too, like how they joined the family. Once again, this is all speculation, but if this were to be the case, this chapter could be an opportunity to solve a lot of ongoing mysteries on what is happening with the Dreamer family, and potentially with Chris. There is also going to be some scenes in Chapter 3 that will serve the purpose of developing Undyne's character too. There are parts of Undyne that I could see some development. In Chapter 1, she complains about how boring her job is and how nothing really happens in this hometown. If you know Undyne from Undertale, she tends to be really eager for action, both in the date scene and in her battle. In Deltarune, we can see that being the case too from her absolutely dominating at handball on the backstories of Monster Kid and Snowy and her bench-pressing a car in this traffic jam. And just because she can. Gosh, I freaking love Undyne. She also doesn't really have too much backstory related to her either, so that needs to be addressed. So how will this Dark World develop Undyne's character? For one, she won't know that the Dark World exists, of course. I mean, we've been telling her that for two chapters now and she's denying it. <laughs> now that she's in the Dark World, perhaps she's gonna find the Dark World really interesting and appealing and be able to do interesting stuff, like using magic and taking down bad guys, potentially in that crime and investigation area. I know this is something small, but having Undyne doing something interesting in this dark world could potentially change her outlook on life. Regarding the backstory, I could see Undyne giving some hints about it. How did she join the police force? Why was Asgore fired from the police force? Both of these, especially the latter one, are current and big unsolved mysteries of this game which need to be addressed at some point. And here is where I could see these being solved. And there you have it. That's about everything I have for Chapter 3, and boy, there was a lot of it. Let's move on to Chapter 4. When it comes to Chapter 4, there isn't as much information as there is for Chapter 3, but there is still quite a bit. So, based on the evidence that we have, what can I deduce about Chapter 4? In terms of setting, based on many of the pictures from the 2022 status update, which are clearly labeled with Chapter 4 in their file names, it seems at first glance that this chapter will have more of an emphasis on the light world compared to its predecessors, which I could definitely see happening. I highly doubt that it will be a fully light world chapter though, because there is one screenshot and one video that takes place in the castle town labeled Chapter 4 in their titles. 
this time I'll explain about the light world settings first and look at the dark world later. There are three screenshots that involve Chris and Susie exploring around the hometown. This first one is of them at the diner. Susie talks about the Dreamer family and how weird that family is. I could see this as Susie getting a lot more comfortable in and around the Dreamer family, and this would be something that could be developed back in Chapter 3. Maybe I could speculate and go as far as seeing her actually starting to live with the Dreamer family, maybe as a roommate of sorts. Considering that Susie's character development involves her getting more comfortable around others and herself, and also considering her rough home life implied in her backstory, this is definitely something I can see happening with Susie. Plus, it even plays into the escapism theme a little bit. Moving on to the second screenshot, this is of Susie practicing her rock throwing skills. This could imply that there is going to be a lot of interesting stuff that we can do in the light world. Plus, it's also more about Susie solidifying her friendship with Chris, a pretty common theme in this game. Now for this third screenshot, or gif. This is of Chris and Susie near the police station in the rain, watching this little guy playing in the puddle. Huh, that's interesting. So yeah, it's looking like Chapter 4 will definitely have some additional gameplay taking place in the light world. Definitely something I'd like to see in this game. So far, the first two chapters have been quite linear gameplay-wise. I get that from a development and new player standpoint, and there's no problem with that. I really do like the idea of Deltrin becoming a little more open world in the later chapters, as it really adds to the already well-established immersion that this game already has. Pretty awesome if you ask me. In terms of the castle town, I don't think too much will happen here. There is this one video where we see the queen showing off her room and her blasting speaker setup. I found this pretty cool fan animation by Cody that expands upon the original teaser video. I could see this section being of the queen showing off her room and her making some computer and internet references, some jokes thrown into the mix, maybe even some callbacks to chapter 2. I like this kind of stuff especially as a software engineer, but since this video focuses on the game's story, it's not too relevant here. There is one more GIF that takes place in the cafe in Chapter 4 that shows many of the recruits, including that shadow person from Chapter 3, playing a song. It also appears that the cafe has had many changes done to it, including the addition of a stage and some of the tables being moved around. Again, this is some really cool stuff, I get it, but this is just a small little detail. Not too much relevance to the story, I don't think. And well, that's all we have for Chapter 4, at least according to both the 2022 status update and the spammed and sweepstakes. There aren't any solid hints that relate to what Chapter 4's Dark World is going to be. So for a while, I wasn't sure. But apparently, I did find some evidence that could hint at what Chapter 4's Dark World is going to be. Let's cut straight to the chase. My theory for Chapter 4's Dark World is that it's going to be an art-themed world that might take place in the church. I know that sounds like a really bold statement. Some people might even expect me to go to Chess Fury for this one, but actually, I was able to land on this conclusion without Chess Fury. I won't explain what Chess Fury is here, but if you want to know about it, there's already a good video on that, which I'll make a reference to. So, what evidence did I find that allowed me to land on this conclusion? All of this evidence comes courtesy of, once again, Spamton. There is this one line where he mentions that we don't need easels or CRTs. It's likely that the CRT's part references the theme of Chapter 3's Dark World, which we already know is TV slash entertainment. So, what about the easel's part? An easel is typically an apparatus for storing and working on pieces of art. Considering that the CRT's part references Chapter 3's Dark World theme, what if that means that Chapter 4 is going to be an art themed world, and that this easel's part makes reference to that? Huh. I know this is a stretch, but this is the only line in the entire game that could possibly make reference to Chapter 4's theme. So now, how did I land on my conclusion that this Dark World takes place in the church? There is another line from Spamton that mentions turning Smooze and Daves into Rows and Graves, and those Caffold Screens into Caffold Screams. That Caffold Screens into Caffold Screams line probably makes reference to Chapter 3 like before. But oh boy, turning Smooze and Daves into Rows and Graves? What does that mean? Let's analyze this line. Smooth is just a slang term for foolish or stupid people. Dave's is a slang term for really cool people. Rose and Graves, however. Ooh, that tells me something interesting. I interpret this as some strange way to see people dying and a grave erecting in their place. 
Graves, and in general, burials, are fairly common in religions, which is the case for the religion in Deltarune. Religion is a very strong theme in Deltarune. Our main objective, mentioned in a legend, is to banish the Angel's Heaven by sealing the Dark Fountains. There are mentions of the Angel in the Hometown's religion, as well as many mentions of Christmas, as well as many mentions of praying. There's also the Holiday Family too, which has its ties to Christmas and the Church. Since I've deduced that Rose and Graves could make a reference to Deltarune's religious themes, and the CRT line right after referencing Chapter 3's Dark World, possibly, I can see Chapter 4's Dark World having a religious element to it, hence why I landed on the church for the location of Chapter 4's Dark World. So in summary, Chapter 4's Dark World is going to be an art-themed world that takes place in the church. Unfortunately though, this is all I can really get. I don't have any evidence on what the sub areas of this Dark World could be, or even what some of the new characters we could come across in the Dark World are. I had to stretch things just to land on the female location of this Dark World, and unless I go into some crazy speculation, I don't really have too much more to say about this chapter's settings. So now, what about characters? Since I have no idea what new characters we could meet in Chapter 4 Dark World, or even what bosses or new game mechanics we can come across, what existing characters could I see taking part in this Dark World, assuming that it does take place at the church? I was only able to land on three possible candidates for this Dark World, Alvin, Noel, and possibly Rudy. Alvin is fairly easy to see as he is the one who leads in running the church, in the hometown, as well as the graveyard. In Chapter 2, we can even see him mourning his deceased father, Gerson Moom, the turtle shopkeeper from Undertale, who was a fantastic writer based on his infamous book, Laura the Hammer and Deltarune. Based on these, I could see Alvin taking part of this dark world, potentially. What about Noelle? I did mention before in my prediction for her character that I could see her taking part in some of the Dark Worlds in future chapters. This is when I could see her making a return to the Dark Worlds. She has strong ties to religion, of course, which is obvious with her love for Christmas. Now, is there any evidence that supports her being a part of this Dark World? Actually, there is. In Chapter 2, Rudy mentions about possibly feeling good enough to go to the church tomorrow, and there's some implications here that Noelle is going to be there too. That's about it though. This line is how I landed on Rudy potentially taking part in this Dark World as well. That is assuming that he does get better though, but if he does, he would definitely be a part of it. Now there is a problem with this theory though. An established pattern we've seen in this game so far is that one chapter represents one day. The only way this would work is that chapters 3 and 4 both happen on the same day, which would break this pattern. It can be argued that the Dark World for Chapter 3 might be explored through the night, and will emerge from it during midday, and Chapter 4 might start from there. But that is stretching things a little, so I'll leave that for you to think about. Now that we've established some candidates, what will the major character and the side character of Chapter 4's Dark World be? Since Noelle was already the major character of Chapter 2, I can easily cross her off as being a part of this chart. That leaves Alvin and Rudy as the remaining candidates. Now, how should I place these two? Unfortunately, I just don't know how to populate this with the information that I have. This could go either way, and for all I know, they might not even be the right characters to put here. It could even be Jockington and Caddy for all I know. I did mention them as Dark World candidates before, so they aren't completely out of the picture. It's just that based on what we have right now, you don't know. So unfortunately, this pattern that I've established before that ended up working for Chapter 3 just doesn't work here in Chapter 4, and I'll have to scrap it. This is not to say that there isn't a major character and side character of Chapter 4, but based on what we have, I can't really say what they are. So well, that's all I can really say about the characters that might be present in Chapter 4's Dark World. So now, what about the major scenes or events? Once again, I don't have too much to say for this chapter. We do know about one of these, which is that queen scene we've seen before. So what else is there for this chapter? Since this chapter is probably going to have strong ties to religion, I could see some scenes that might serve the purpose to solve or provide additional information about some of the mysteries regarding this theme in this chapter. For one, we don't know too much about the angel. The angel has a very strong significance to the story. One of the main objectives of the prophecy is to banish the angel's heaven. The angel is also a major part of the Deltarune symbol, and is also what is worshipped at the church. As of right now, we don't know what the angel is yet, 
and I feel that this is the chapter where we can know more about it. Now I know there are some theories out there that theorize that Noel is the angel, but I have my doubts on that. There are some lines in the Weird Route that reference her as an angel, so I can see where they are coming from, but I highly doubt they are referencing her as the angel of the prophecy. What I think is, is that they are referencing her as someone who has the qualities of an angel, like beauty, purity, or kindliness, which would make a lot more sense for Noelle's character. Yes, I know she's powerful and all, but I don't think she's that powerful. Not even close. Nor will she ever be, probably. Lastly, I could see some scenes that could give us some more insight on the Holiday family in this chapter, assuming that Noelle and possibly Rudy play a role. One of the biggest mysteries of this game so far is what happened to Des. I could see this chapter as us getting some more insight about her, and perhaps even the circumstances that led to her going missing. Perhaps this could also be the chapter where we can finally go past these ornate gates and visit Noelle's house, which would reveal a lot about the Holiday family and about Noelle. Something that I would love to see. Now, I am speculating here and basing this on some assumptions, but to me, this chapter would make the most sense due to the religious ties that the Holiday family has. And well, that's all I have for Deltarune's fourth chapter. I know that some of these are a little speculative, but compared to what I had to do for the following three chapters, this is going to seem a little tame in comparison. Let's move on to chapter five. Okay, here we are, chapter five. At this point, the evidence that point to anything this far into the game is few and far in between, and none of them point to any specific chapter. A lot of the evidence that I had for chapters 3 and 4 were easy to place in those chapters, either because they were handed to us on a silver platter, or they were easy to place based on some other related evidence that are marked in a specific chapter. But now that I am here, things are a lot more fuzzy and I'm going to have to speculate on a lot of things to fill the gaps. You gotta remember that after all, all of my theories in this video are based on evidence just from the first two chapters of the game which are the only chapters I have to work with at the time of making this video. I'll warn you now, take whatever I see here and out with a grain of salt. I might get a lot of things wrong here, because at this point, I have almost nothing to go off of. I might as well be writing fanfiction at this point, which a lot of this is probably going to end up being. I think you'll be okay with that. So now that I've gotten that disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. So in order to formulate my theories for these last three chapters, I am going to need to come up with a new strategy in order to construct something this far into the game. This is what I came up with. This new strategy of theory crafting is what I like to dub the puzzle piece strategy. So here's how it works. The strategy of theory crafting involves constructing a set of puzzle pieces, which comprise of different theories based on certain pieces of evidence, which you could develop using the Tevex method like before. These puzzle pieces can be of three different types. One for characters, which comprise of anything character related like character arcs and bosses for example. I will represent this with a yellow puzzle piece. There will be a puzzle piece for anything related to setting, which I will represent with a red puzzle piece. And one for major plot points, which I will represent with a purple puzzle piece. So now, what do you do with these puzzle pieces? <laughs> what you do with these puzzle pieces is that through some form of judgment, you find a way to arrange these puzzle pieces in order in certain chapters in such a way that it would make the most sense for the game's story, plot, and characters. What this strategy does is that it allows us to at least give us an idea on how these final chapters of the game could go, even with the little evidence that we have and with the knowledge of the game's themes and trends. As you can already tell, this is going to be a less accurate form of theory crafting, as it depends on judgment to place these pieces. The placements of the puzzle pieces I have constructed in this video are based on my own judgement and what works best for me based on my knowledge of Deltarune's story and themes. I know that there could be many ways to construct and arrange these puzzle pieces that would still be sensible for the story and would probably be more sensible than what I have, but I do feel that whatever arrangement that I have here would still make for a sensible and fascinating story. Just know that the puzzle pieces themselves and the order and the inclusion of these puzzle pieces in each chapter could be different from what the actual these chapters would be. Alright, I think you know how this works. Let's start on chapters 5, 6, and 7, starting with chapter 5. 
Deltrune so far has been full of memes, funny laughs, wholesome characters, and incredible adventures. But I feel that from this chapter on, this is where Deltrune is going to start to take on a much darker tone. Darkness is a fairly prevalent theme in Deltrune, both figuratively and literally. Examples of the figurative sense would be this one line from Shom, where they mention about their view of the world getting darker yet darker when talking about Chevel, and the sad and dark undertones of Noel's character. Example of the literal sense would be the Dark Worlds, and this one page in the Spampton sweepstakes where it mentions, what if it could get darker than dark? I'm starting to get into some really crazy territory here, and I should probably take my foot out of the dark water before I fall in. <laughs> in short, Daltrim's gonna get darker. I can see Chapter 5 as being more of a setup chapter, to get us ready for the much darker tone that I think will be prevalent in the endgame. I was able to come up with three puzzle pieces for this chapter, and I have placed them in this order. These first two relate to events that revolve around some character development, and this last puzzle piece is a major plot point that will help in setting up the darker tone to get us into the endgame. Now what I'm going to do is explain how I arrived at these three puzzle pieces, and the reason why I placed them in this order. So, let's get started. Let's start off by exploring this first puzzle piece, which relates to some character development I could see happening in this chapter. I should probably mention about some of the wording I used back in Chapter 4. You know how I always use the word possibly when describing Rudy's presence in Chapter 4's Dark World? I did that on purpose. You wanna know why? Because I have a sneaking suspicion that either in this chapter, or between chapters 4 and 5, Doel's fears will come true, and that Rudy will in fact pass away from his illness. This might come as a surprise to a lot of you, but based on the implications present in one line from the game, I believe this might happen. Remember this line that I've referenced many, many times where Noel says, It wouldn't just be me and Mom? This line does reveal a lot. Noelle's helplessness and Dessa's absence from the family. But I feel that this line is actually revealing something even more significant. I think that this line may actually be foreshadowing Rudy's passing. Now I know this is an extremely bold and controversial theory, perhaps a sad and heartbreaking one at that, and I know I'm holding the burden of proof in proposing this. So if you can hear me out, I'll talk for my reasoning as to why I think this might happen and how significant it is to the story. For one, this tragic event would fit in line with the darker tone that I can see developing in this chapter. Secondly, I can see this tragic event opening up a ton of potential character development for Noelle. There is a major problem with her character that I have yet to resolve in my future prediction for her character development, her overarching sadness and her nuances. This is something that is very apparent in Chapter 2. Queen mentions about Noelle making strange and sad searches in her first boss fight. Noelle's sadness is ultimately the reason why the Queen chose her as her peon, because in actuality, Queen wanted to make the world that is the best for her, where she can escape from all the troubles she has in the light world. This is ultimately the reason why at the end of Chapter 2, Queen says to Noelle, Choose the world that makes you happy. This very part of Noelle's character is what I was planning to resolve in this redemption arc that I proposed back in my prediction for her character development, and have decided to leave until now. Because this is where I think this might take place. You know, you're probably thinking right now, how is her character going to improve than this? She just lost her dad! Hear me out, I'll get to that. If you've seen Spider Mike's fan animation, What If Noelle Lost Her Way, you can already see where I'm going with this. A lot of this theory is actually based on this fan animation, and it deserves all the credit it can get. So, what's the aftermath of Rudy's passing going to be like for Noelle? Obviously, when Rudy passes away, she is going to go on a steep negative character arc. Her losing the one parent that balanced out her rough mother, and this being on top of her losing her sister a long time ago too, will hurt her a lot. She'll feel completely helpless about being able to do anything to save her dad completely heartbroken, fall into a deep depression, completely losing all hope, and wishing that she could go back to the way things were before. You can kind of see my point I made a long time ago, where I see Noelle as a hit you hard in the feels kind of character. So how is Noelle going to recover from this, and where's the redemption part of this character arc? I can see a scene, perhaps in the graveyard area like in the fan animation, where she would spill the beans to the main cast about all of the trouble she's had regarding the loss of her sister, how she was treated by her mother, 
and her feeling completely helpless in saving her father. She might even say that the only reason she was able to cope with these hard feelings was to be nice and helpful to everyone, and make them smile so that she can look past these hard feelings and hold them in. In response, these characters might comfort her, and tell her that she has friends that she can fall back on, friends that can help her, friends that she can say no to, and that even at the lowest part of her life, she still has friends that will be there for her. This scene would significantly develop Nono's character. Not only would she break free from a lot of the sadness she was holding in for potentially years, and finally speaking out about it, but it would also free up a lot of the helplessness that she has now that she realizes that she has friends that can help her. Now you can see how Nono's character would improve, and how I label this as a redemption arc. This scene could serve as a very powerful and inspirational message, mentioning that yes, you can move on from your sadness, and that you have others like family and friends that will be there for you, even at your lowest. So now that I've explained this in full, I think you can now see my position on the matter and why it would be important, both for the story and for resolving the rest of Noelle's character. So well, there you have it. That is the first puzzle piece explained that I have placed in Chapter 5. The second puzzle piece, which is also another character piece, explains a major scene revolving around an important character that up until now, I have yet to explain in full. That character being, the Roaring Knight. If you don't already know, the Knight is this mysterious character that has been creating the Dark Worlds that we've been exploring so far, and has also been the overarching main antagonist of the whole story. Much of what we were doing in the story so far was sealing the fountains that the Knight opened, and restoring the balance of light and dark, which goes against what the Knight is doing. As of right now, we don't really know who the Knight is as of yet. I am not going to go over any candidates because one, it would make the video too long. This video is already too long as is. Two, it could be anyone considering the line Queen says where any lightener can create a dark fountain. So whoever the knight ends up being, there will probably be a scene in this chapter that will reveal the knight's identity, what the knight's goals are, why they are making and manipulating these dark worlds, like how they changed out the king in chapter 1's dark world, and whether they are doing it out of desires of escapism, curiosity, or perhaps something a little more sinister. As the knight is the main antagonist of the story, I could perhaps see a boss fight against the knight, and that it might be the main boss fight of chapter 5, which I could see happening near the end of the chapter, which has been the case for the main antagonist of the first two Dark Worlds. So why did I place this puzzle piece in chapter 5? All I can really say is that I placed the knight here based on my own judgement, and that its placement made sense to me based on the other puzzle pieces that I made. I know I've only explained two of them so far, but once I get through them all, I think you can see why I placed the knight here. Other than that, I don't have too much more to say about this puzzle piece. Let's move on to the third and final puzzle piece of Chapter 5. This final puzzle piece of Chapter 5 is a major plot point that I could see happening at the very end of this chapter that will help further set up the darker tone of the endgame, which I should mention is Chapter 6 and 7. This is going to be a big plot point that will have the most impact on the story. The reason this is a big plot point is that this is where I can see Deltrin's climax taking place. Are you ready for this? This puzzle piece is going to represent the start of the Roaring. The Roaring is a cataclysmic event that will happen if too many dark fountains are opened. Rousey measures that when the Roaring happens, the land will crack in fear. The Titans will take form from the fountains, and envelop the land in chaos and devastation. All of the Darkners will turn to statues, and the remaining Lightners will be lost in a dark, endless night. There are some lines in the first two chapters that could potentially foreshadow the Roaring. Rousey warns us about the Roaring at the end of Chapter 2, which is an example of one of these. If you pacify Jevil, he mentions about a nightmare that will awaken within our hearts in the shadow of the Knight's hand, which could make a reference to the Roaring. If you defeat Jevil by attacking, Jevo mentions about the knight's hand drifting forward, bringing the queen's return, and hell's roar bubbling from the depths, which could also make a reference to the roaring. Lastly, this one line I've mentioned before, where in order for us to see the mayor of hometown, we would need to cause a terrible crisis. That terrible crisis could be the roaring. Based on all of this foreshadowing, I could definitely see the roaring happening at some point in this game. I decided to place it at the end of chapter 5 for one specific reason, you know how Toby wants to release chapters 3, 4, and 5 together? 
I think that because of this, I could see Toby triggering the roaring at the end of Chapter 5, which would leave us on a massive cliffhanger. Toby is no stranger to leaving us on these massive cliffhangers. Look at the ending of Chapters 1 and 2 to see what I mean. So now, how would the roaring affect the story? This would set up the overall setting and tone of the final two chapters of the game, shift the story in a completely different direction, and make everything dark, darker yet darker, and very, very interesting. Whew, that's the craziest I've been this entire video. I need to calm down a little bit. So there you have it. That is my theory for Chapter 5. Let's move on and see how the roaring could impact these final two chapters, starting with Chapter 6. Alright, Chapter 6. Out of all of the chapters in this video, and that includes Chapter 7, this is the chapter that I know the least about and am the least confident in in terms of my theories, as they contain a lot of speculation. So absolutely take everything here for a grain of salt. Chapter 6 is what I would consider the start of the end game for Deltarune. The roaring has just begun, and the main cast of characters are introduced to this new, much more hostile environment. So, now that the roaring is in place, how do I see everyone handling this cataclysmic event? At first, I don't think they will handle it very well. With the peaceful world that they once knew suddenly turning into something significantly different, I don't think they'll have the courage to save it just yet. What I can see happening is that in light of this cataclysmic event, the main cast, as well as everyone else, will have no choice but to take shelter in the bunker at the south of town, and that the main setting of Chapter 6 might take place within there. This leads me pretty well into the first puzzle piece that I've placed in Chapter 6. A setting puzzle piece, which represents the bunker. The bunker, or shelter as it is referred as in the game's files, has some significance to the story so far. If we go to the bunker in Chapter 2, Monster Kid and Snowy talk about how there could be something scary inside the bunker. Susie questions what Chris's deal with this place was, and that they don't need to talk about it. This suggests to me that some traumatic event has taken place here a long time ago. This leads me to the second puzzle piece of this chapter. I have a pretty fascinating theory about what could have happened here, but it's pure speculation though. I have an idea that whatever event that took place a long time ago and that caused Chris some trauma might have been the reason why Des has gone missing and that she has been in that bunker the whole time. Perhaps in an adventure that Chris, Asriel, Noel, and Des went on as kids, they stumbled upon this bunker. Maybe some of them, probably Chris and Des, went into the bunker, and Chris was the only one who walked out of the bunker, and Des either got lost, or was captured by that aforementioned scary being that Monster Kid and Snowy could be talking about. This could perhaps explain the trauma that Chris has near the bunker, as they were the ones who witnessed the whole event inside it. Now we can move on to explaining what could happen when the cast finally enters the bunker, how this chapter might play out, and how they could find and save Des. I think a good way to set the groundwork for this theory is to start it off by mentioning the main driving force of the plot of another piece of literature, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. There's going to be spoilers for this book ahead, so if you haven't read it, skip straight to chapter 7. I'll be referring to the game based on the original book for this explanation, and I'm going to be skipping over a lot of details just to keep this brief. The main driving point of this book's plot is, of course, the Chamber of Secrets. Closing in on the end of the book, Jeannie Weasley suddenly disappeared. Some writing near Morning Myrtle's bathroom was added, which mentioned, her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. Obviously referring to Ginny. After Harry figures out that the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets is a malfunctioning sink in Morning Myrtle's bathroom, he was able to open it with parcel tongue. He jumps into the Chamber of Secrets and explores through the catacombs to later find Ginny Weasley, unconscious, along with Tom Riddle, now Lord Voldemort. Harry has to take down the heir of Slytherin to defeat Lord Voldemort, save Ginny, and make their way out of the Chamber of Secrets. I could see Deltrun Chapter 6 playing on in a similar manner to the ending of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. The main characters of the game would enter the bunker, they would explore the catacombs of this bunker, and eventually they might find Des. The team would need to save Des and escape from the bunker successfully. Perhaps they might need to fight that scary being inside the bunker in order to escape, 
similar to how Harry had to fight the heir of Slytherin in the book. This might come as a surprise to a lot of you, but that's all I was able to come up with in Chapter 6. The first puzzle piece represents the main setting of the chapter, the bunker, and the second puzzle piece represents the cast finding deaths within the bunker. So there you have it, that is everything I have for Chapter 6. That leaves us with Chapter 7. We have made it. Chapter 7. After a long adventure in the bunker, the Legends were able to escape successfully, but they have come to realize that their world is really starting to collapse around them. The Titans have taken form, and they have brought destruction to the land. That leaves them with only one option left in order to save the world from destruction and from darkness. This leads me to the first puzzle piece of Chapter 7, where they need to do the following. They need to fight... The Titans. Rousey warns us about the Titans taking form from the fountains and bringing destruction to the world during the Roaring. Since the Roaring has been going on for some time now, it is almost certain that by now, the Titans would have formed from the fountains and have already caused chaos. The Titans have some significance to the story so far, although not much as of right now. There are some symbols present on the Titans that are present in the game thus far. These eyes on the Titans are similar to the ones we see at the cliffs back at the start of Chapter 1's Dark World. The faces of the Titans have a resemblance to the save points that we've seen throughout the game. Other than that, that's about it. Now that the Titans have formed and are now taking over the world, the only way the world could be saved now would be to fight the Titans and defeat them. That means that the heroes would have no choice but to come face to face with these Titans and use all of the power, all of the will, and all of the determination they have built up over the whole game to defeat them. This would be an incredibly high stakes boss fight. The whole world along with everyone's lives are on the line here, and if these titans aren't defeated, the whole world would be destroyed and shrouded in darkness. If we can manage to defeat the titans however, the world will be saved and everyone will live to see another day. And with that, that is the first puzzle piece I have came up with in chapter 7. We fight the titans, and we defeat them. I placed this puzzle piece here since it would transition pretty well after escaping from the bunker, and it is something that will happen after the roaring begins. So there you go. Let's move on to the final puzzle piece of Chapter 7, and of the whole game. This last puzzle piece is a plot puzzle piece that represents the heroes stopping the roaring, and once again bringing peace to the world. I think the best way to explain this puzzle piece is to talk through a sort of proof of concept storyline, which I will do right now. With the Titans successfully defeated, the world is saved from further destruction, but the roaring is still going on. There is still one more very important thing that they need to do in order to save the world and stop the roaring. One more puzzle piece left to the puzzle. The three heroes look back to the prophecy foretold to them long ago on the first day of their adventure. Three heroes appear at World's Edge, a human, a monster, and a prince from the dark. Only they can seal the fountains and banish the angels' heaven. Only then will balance be restored, and the world saved from destruction. So that's exactly what they do. The three heroes go to each of the dark fountains and seal them one by one, each fountain closed just like the last. They come across the last fountain. They all take a deep breath, then they proceed to seal it. With the last fountain sealed, the roaring stops. The black sky that once shrouded the land grows blue, and the balance between light and dark has been restored. And with that, the world was successfully saved. The angel's heaven that once bared down on them was banished, bringing peace back to the world. The heroes prevailed in defeating the titans, the prophecy was fulfilled, and everyone was saved. And with that, that is the second and final puzzle piece of Chapter 7. The heroes fulfilled the prophecy by sealing the dark fountains and banishing the angels' heaven to save the world from destruction. So there you have it. That is what might happen in Deltrune's final chapter, and how the game might end.
And with that one last chapter explained, I have explained everything that I wanted to explain in my chapter by chapter section of my theory, and my future chapter theory as a whole. It's been a long journey. We've been through a lot. I've proposed a lot of theories, speculated here and there, and even played around with some puzzle pieces near the end. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. So, let's seal the fury fountain and end the video once and for all. Wow, that was such a crazy video. I would have never thought that this video would take me two and a half months to put together, have a runtime dangerously close to the two hour mark, and a script consisting of 34 pages and over 21,000 words. That was such a journey for me, and I enjoyed every last bit of it. Well, most of it anyway. I hope that you had fun watching this video as much as I did making it, and that it gave you some interesting ideas, inquiries, and tools for constructing theories about the future chapters of Deltarune. Now, remember that this is a theory video after all, trying to predict the entirety of a game of seven chapters based on the first two chapters that are out. So there's a good chance that a lot of the theories included in this video might be wrong. But I am confident that there are some theories in this video that will be correct and might actually be in the future chapters of Deltarune. There are also a few things that I've left out of this video that I should probably acknowledge. Yes, I did not include anything related to W.D. Gaster in this video, or whoever the person who greets us at the beginning and the person who drove Travel and spent him mad is, commonly referred to as Gaster by the community. I do acknowledge that whoever they are, they are a very important character. I also didn't include anything about the eggs, the shadow crystals, or too much about the weird route in this video either. The reason that I didn't include these is that there just isn't enough evidence for these things to come up with anything solid and extrapolate them to the future chapters. So that's why I left those out. Maybe using the tools I showed you in this video, you can come up with theories that address these things that I've left out. So don't be afraid to go ham. I was also going to explain about what the game's ending is going to be, whether it will have one ending or multiple endings. But I realized while I was writing that section of the video that it would fit better as its own video. So watch out for that in the coming weeks. At the end of the day, you gotta remember that Toby is a great story writer. I'm just some random software engineer with video editing experience who loves this game with all of my heart. Toby knows what is best for his game, me, not so much. Whether or not some, most, or even all of my theories in this video end up being wrong, just know that whatever Toby has planned for the next chapters of Deltarune, it will be an awesome, unforgettable, and incredible life-changing experience for all of us. And that concludes my nearly two hour long Deltarune theory video. If you've watched to the end, all I can really say is thank you. You are awesome. Or you just really love Deltrin like I do. Nothing wrong with that. And with that, I am Red, and thank you for watching.